He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin, our number 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Let me start tonight by talking about the election. I do want to move on to other things, but you're getting a lot of bum information out there. Too many people providing you advice or information either worked in the Bush administration or worked for the RNC or worked on Capitol Hill. But almost none of them worked in the campaign of Ronald Reagan. I mean, I have to confess, 1980 was 43 years ago. And 1976 was 47 years ago. 1984, you can figure it out. Reagan won the two biggest landslides in modern American history. And he ran as a unequivocal conservative. He ran in the Republican primaries against the conservative challenging the Republican establishment and ruling class. That Republican establishment and ruling class has not gone away and they never will. They get too much power, they get too much attention, they get too much money. Mitch McConnell is a throwback to the Gerald Ford era. Chris Christie is a throwback to the George Bush era and before. Chris Sununu is a throwback to the George Bush era. Now, Sununu is the governor of New Hampshire. He's been elected there. His case is unique. His daddy was elected there. Chris Sununu, uh, excuse me, Chris Christie got elected first time around because the governor was corrupt, unethical, an adulterer, and extremely unpopular. So you need these special circumstances. They're not examples to emulate. They're one-offs. But Reagan's an example to emulate. And why don't we ever look at his campaigns? And why don't we ever look at how he campaigned? And what the issues were? Oh, Mark, it's all changed. No, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. Of course, issues change and move and so forth, but the fundamentals are the same. Let's take abortion. Abortion. Why are we losing on abortion? And I'll be very blunt with you, because Democrat Party billionaires and interest groups are willing to spend 10 times more than Republican billionaires and interest groups on explaining that issue. So the Democrat Party defines the Republican candidate lies about the Republican candidate, lies about their position, and so you have an election based on a lie. When the Democrat Party is actually extremely vulnerable on this issue. Nobody believes that a baby should be aborted with partial birth abortion right up to the last second of birth. 
Nobody believes there shouldn't be parental notification for 12, 10, 15-year-olds who are pregnant and seek abortions. And yet the, the ambiguous ballot language in Ohio provides for that. Now, it was just a few months ago where the media were insisting the Democrat Party was insisting. Pasaki on MSNBC was insisting they're not extremists on abortion, but they are. And notice they don't criticize the Dobbs decision anymore. Why is that? Because they're able to implement, institute by statute or constitutional amendment. Abortion legislation or amendments that are much more extreme than Roe v. Wade ever was. This is actually a rather simple issue. Now, in Loudoun County, Virginia, where I spent the last few months, my family, of course, but I go back and forth between Florida, I was watching the Democrats lie about this issue. Lie, 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 over and over again. Must have been five ads to one for the Republican. The Republican billionaires are not as patriotic. I'm telling you the truth. They're not as patriotic. They're not as conservative as they used to be. As, uh, as the Democrats are not patriotic in supporting the Democrat candidates. We don't have a George Soros. They have 10 of them. We don't have one of them. Not one. And as for the Republican base, 2010 was the Tea Party year. And the Tea Party was brutally attacked by the Wall Street Journal editorial page, by Mitch McConnell, who was the Republican leader back then, by the GOP establishment, by the GOP donors and billionaires. This was a spontaneous movement that delivered scores of seats, over 60 seats for the House of Representatives, several U.S. Senate seats. And yet Mitch McConnell, whose protege lost and lost badly in Kentucky, attacked the base. National Review attacked the base. The Wall Street Journal attacked the base. We could have won more seats if only we had nominated XYZ. Never taking responsibility for the rhinos who lost seats. Ever. And for the rhinos, the ruling class, establishment, call them what you will, they not only lose seats, even if we win those seats, we haven't won much. But Mitch McConnell's into a purity system to clean the Republican Party from its base. That's why he wouldn't support Ted Cruz when he was in a close election. That's why he wouldn't support Mike Lee when he was in a close election. I can go down and down and down the list. Now, what was it about Reagan? First of all, he had a fantastic personality, and he was a very handsome man. He had enormous charisma. But that's not all. Reagan took a position on four, five, six things, and he was utterly clear about them. And they were as solid as could be. Slashing taxes. Lifting regulations on oil and gasoline so it would be plentiful and cheap. Building up the United States military. Keeping the Panama Canal. And a handful of other issues. And he and his campaign geniuses, including one of my mentors, former Attorney General Meese, they define the left. They define the left. I think Governor Yunkin is a good man. He's a good governor. But if you're going to take charge of the election in Virginia and raise money mostly through your PAC, you've got to take the gloves off. You've got to define the other side. You must define them. And you must spend the money necessary to define them. In Kentucky, Cameron was a lackluster candidate who was all over the map. 
running against an incumbent Democrat. Trump won that seat, I'm trying to remember, was it over 20%? Yes, maybe over 30% he won that state, I should say. So what did Reagan do? He defined the other side. He made it abundantly clear what he stood for. He was opposed by McConnell, Gerald Ford. He was opposed by the Bushes. He was opposed, essentially, by the same people who oppose you and me, oppose you and me today, by the same people who oppose the Tea Party. The difference between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party is the Republican Party hates its base. The Democrat Party taps dances to its base. But what is a base? That's your activists. Those are the people who are motivated. Those are the people who are focused. You can't keep attacking your base and expect it to turn out. And that's what McConnell and the Washington, D.C. Republicans continue to do. That's what they continue to do. You need to fire up your base. You need to build excitement and momentum around your candidates, around your issues. And the rhinos don't want to unite behind these candidates. First thing Chris Christie did is he blamed the Kentucky loss on Donald Trump. And this slob goes around the country, speaks to Republicans and attacks Republicans, speaks to conservatives and attacks conservatives. You'd think this guy's on the Democrat Party payroll the way he conducts himself. Or we have TV hosts who keep bringing on Christie, Mr. 3%. Keep bringing on Chris Sununo. Keep bringing on Carl Rove. Keep bringing on people who have absolutely no connection to the base. And in fact, the base finds them contemptible. I think that's purposeful. When hosts do things like that, that's purposeful. Why is Rona McDaniel still the chair of the RNC? Well, Donald Trump supported her. And the Republican establishment supported her, so they agreed on that. Yours truly opposed her. Openly opposed her. Had her opponent on my show. Why? It's not about personalities with me. She's a loser. Benny Johnson online on the internet, he writes, Since she's been the head of the RNC, we've lost eight governors. Governor seats. We've lost three Senate seats, we've lost 18 House seats, and one presidential race. That's outrageous. The Republican National Committee is not producing. And yet she'll be back on TV talking about all the great things they're doing. They ought to at least have a group over there to talk about how they're going to confront this abortion issue and get the word out. I mean, I don't understand what the problem is. I really don't. All of a sudden, the nation supports abortion on demand, partial birth abortion, the elimination of parental notification. No, the nation doesn't support that. At all. I've told you before, if you folks read The Democrat Party Hates America, I have a section on this, that the most loyal voting base of the Democrat Party is not the black community. It's not the gay community. It's young women without children. That's the core of the core of their base. So they run on abortion to turn out that vote, whether it's in the city, whether it's in the suburbs, wherever it is. Young single women without children. They're the most extremist on the issue of abortion. And so that's what they focus on. They're able to define this as a woman's right, as free to choose, a liberty issue. In Kentucky, they had commercials with a 12-year-old young girl who was pregnant. Planned Parenthood was behind that. Now, 12-year-old young girl who's pregnant... 10-year-old girl who's pregnant? 
I think we can agree that with parental notification, that family should make its own decision. That said, the left, the Democrat Party, and the media have dehumanized human babies. They've dehumanized them. Just as they dehumanized so many other people. We should, we should start to push back. Now, I want to talk more about this because it's not just abortion. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Have you been waiting to buy gold as an investment? Lots of commercials out there, but who can you really trust? I didn't want to make a bad investment, but didn't want to miss the boat either. Sound familiar? Fortunately, I've got great news. If you have an IRA or 401k and want to buy physical gold to diversify your investment, eliminate fear and uncertainty from the process, get the new gold IRA company integrity checklist. It helps you evaluate and choose the best gold IRA company. To get your free IRA company integrity checklist today, text LEVIN to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Now, I trust Augusta Precious Metals and invested myself. Use this checklist to choose the best gold IRA company for yourself and see if you agree. To get your free gold IRA company integrity checklist today, text L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Again, text L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Text date and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at Augusta Precious Metals dot com. We have a lot of young people in the Republican Party who blow off Reagan. That would be like a Democrat blowing off Franklin Roosevelt. You got to learn from Reagan with his massive majorities in uh, both the popular vote and the electoral college vote. Now, the country's demographic has changed significantly since then. But he's still the biggest winner the Republicans have ever had, ever. And rather than trying to destroy Ron DeSantis, of course, it's a presidential primary. What's fair is fair. But rather than destroy him and lie about his record in Florida, his record should be studied. He went from 40,000 vote, slimmest of slim victories, to winning with almost 60% of the vote in four years. He changed Florida's demographics and political makeup radically, completely, to benefit the Republicans. And he's the most conservative governor in the United States. And he fights the culture wars. And he fights the, the budget wars. And he fights the immigration issues. And he fights the vaccine issues. Well, how did he do it? What does he do that made him so successful as governor of Florida? Florida was a purple state leaning red. It's now a bright, bright apple red state. You don't destroy the the people who show you how to do these things. You study them. You learn from them. Not from the rhinos, not from the losers. There were a lot of good candidates who ran yesterday. It wasn't a matter of candidate selection. I'll be right back. Have you been waiting to buy gold as an investment? Lots of commercials out there, but who can you really trust? I didn't want to make a bad investment, but didn't want to miss the boat either. Sound familiar? Fortunately, I've got great news. If you have an IRA or 401k and want to buy physical gold to diversify your investment, eliminate fear and uncertainty from the process, get the new gold IRA company integrity checklist. It helps you evaluate and choose the best gold IRA company. To get your free IRA company integrity checklist today, text LEVIN to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Now, I trust Augusta Precious Metals and invested myself. Use this checklist to choose the best gold IRA company for yourself and see if you agree. To get your free gold IRA company integrity checklist today, text L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Again, text L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Text date and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at Augusta Precious Metals Mark Levin, the George S. Patton 
Facebook Talk Radio. Call him at 877-381-3811. That's 877-381-3811. You know, the only billionaire that I can think of who consistently was generous with an enormous amount of money was Sheldon Adelson, the late Sheldon Adelson. Money for the House, money for the Senate, money for presidential candidates. We have multi-billionaires on the Republican side. People were two, three, twenty-five, fifty billion dollars, twenty million, forty million, fifty million. For them, that's like buying a hot dog at a baseball game. Don't they care about this country too? If they cared about saving this country as much as the Democrat radical left-wing billionaires cared about destroying it, that would sure help. But there's other things here. Mitch McConnell is out of sync. Mitch McConnell has always been about Mitch McConnell. And he gets the backing from the liberal media, the left-wing media, Politico, the Washington Post, the New York Times, when he blames conservatives. The Tea Party Revolution, the Reagan Revolution, the Trump Revolution. And he's not a leader, he's a figurehead. And so are most of the senior people in the Senate around him. These aren't fighters. They look down on the conservatives in the House. They look down on the base that elects them. They'd rather be in the minority than have these these crazy conservatives in the Senate and in the House and in the Oval Office. I've seen it up close, folks. You're listening to one of the few hosts in America. Bongino's run for office. He knows what I'm talking about. But you're listening to one of the few, I said, who's been involved in your presidential campaign for Reagan in 76 when we lost Lost to the rhinos. And in 80, when we won. In a massive landslide. And Reagan was still undercut by the Republican establishment. He wanted to get rid of the Department of Education. He was blocked by Mark Hatfield and Howard Baker. And they were in the majority in the Senate. No thanks to their campaigns. They wrote his coattails into office. This is the problem. You had approximately 190 Democrats in the House yesterday who voted against censuring Rashida Tlaib and media, even friendly media. Well, you get it right. She wasn't censured because she criticized Israel. She was censured because she supports the extermination of the Jews in Israel. That's why. You dumb bastards, don't you understand? Now there's things Republicans can do that they're not doing. How come the Republican Party, nationally and in the states, why don't they develop their own election procedures that benefit Republicans? The Democrats do this all the time and then they ram it down our throats. They do it by fiat, they do it by executive orders, they do it by regulations, they do it by legislation, they go to their friendly judge, they get a judge to impose it. What is the election procedures that the Republicans are developing to help Republicans win? There aren't any. They don't even know how to undo or fight the Democrats who keep changing the rules. So why don't we change the rules to our benefit? That's the nature of politics. These Senate Republicans are responsible for them being in the minority and for us having horrific conditions imposed on us by the Biden regime. All but 10 or 12 Senate Republicans voted against McConnell being the Republican leader. And they do this voting in secret. We want to know who votes for him and against him. Because he needs to go. And you and I, I do it all the time, but a bigger group of us need to put pressure on the Republicans in the Senate 
to kick that phony the hell out. And don't replace him with another fool. McDaniels has to go. She's a loser. She's not up to the fight. She's not up to the task. She's just not. The proof is in the pudding. And why aren't we organizing our lawyers to take on their lawyers? Why do we leave people like Giuliani and Eastman and Ellis and others out to hang all by themselves? Why aren't we developing an entire army of lawyers who will go into these states, fight to change the rules, go into these states, make challenges left and right? This is what they do. Why won't we do it? So you're going to hear every buffoon with a microphone and a camera in their face try and figure out what's going on. I'm telling you what's going on. I lived this. As a young man. Conservatism works. And when it's explained properly, people embrace it. How much juxtaposition was there on inflation when the Democrats, the Democrats in power, not when the Republicans were in power? The border, on and on, the issues are so one sided in our favor. But they can't figure out how to deal with abortion. Do they listen to this show? Do they pay attention? Do they know how extreme the Democrats are on this issue? The Democrats do not believe in life. Or they'd secure the southern border. Or they would demand more police. Rather than handcuffing the cops and undermining their funding. The Democrats, their number one priority is not life. In fact, it's death. Abortion. Crime in the streets. Those are Democrat cities. Democrat policies. Don't lock up recidivists, even if they're violent, out the back door. There is one little glimmer of light, by the way, in Loudoun County. The Soros-funded and elected prosecutor lost by the skin of her teeth... But so what? She lost. And the law and order sheriff in Loudoun County, Chapman, he won as well. He won as well. We need to have a concerted effort to appoint the kind of federal judges that we need because they make decisions on redistricting and they're making decisions that are killing the Republican Party right now. And Lindsey Graham... Lindsey Graham and I bump into each other from time to time. Lindsey, what you're doing on the Judiciary Committee is intolerable. You're rubber stamping their judges. It's intolerable. And then the other thing we need to do, luckily Romney's bowing out, but he was going to be primaried anyway. Republicans like Romney need to be defeated. I'm not saying they all need to be conservative. But I am saying they can't be saboteurs, backstabbers, Benedict Arnold's. And we have a lot of those in the Republican Party. That needs to be broomed out. That needs to be cleaned away. The Democrats don't have that. Like I said, 190 House Democrats, give or take. They keep talking about the 22. 190, and I posted this earlier, voted to protect. Rashida Tlaib, even though she's using a phrase that connotes the extermination of the Jews. From the river to the sea. It's from the Jordan River to the east of Israel, to the Mediterranean on the west side of Israel. From the river to the sea means the obliteration, 
the extermination of the Jews who reside there. Everybody knows that, especially those Democrats who voted to protect her. 190 of them, and four Republicans. Ken Buck again, because Ken Buck is a head case. He's a head case. But Tom Massey, Tom McClintock, and some other congressman I've never heard of before. Say, we need to focus, you know, on the real issues in this country, and this back and forth stuff isn't going to work. This isn't back and forth stuff. This isn't free speech stuff. She's free to say whatever the hell she wants to. But the House is also free to respond to it. And for Republicans who think this is a waste of time, punishing a member who promotes the extermination of Jews is not a waste of time. That's not a waste of time at all. It provides moral clarity. It demonstrates that there's at least one party in the House of Representatives that will not tolerate it. That's not a waste of time. You guys waste time all the time. That's not a waste of time. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Have you been waiting to buy gold as an investment? Lots of commercials out there, but who can you really trust? I didn't want to make a bad investment, but didn't want to miss the boat either. Sound familiar? Fortunately, I've got great news. If you have an IRA or 401k and want to buy physical gold to diversify your investment, eliminate fear and uncertainty from the process, get the new gold IRA company integrity checklist. It helps you evaluate and choose the best gold IRA company. To get your free IRA company integrity checklist today, text LEVIN to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Now, I trust Augusta Precious Metals and invested myself. Use this checklist to choose the best gold IRA company for yourself and see if you agree. To get your free gold IRA company integrity checklist today, text L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Again, text L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Text date and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at Augusta Precious Metals dot com. By the way, what happened in Virginia is not Governor Youngkin's fault. Guy put his neck on the line, try and pull some candidates across the finish line, but the problem's deeper. The problem's deeper. As I just spent the last 40 minutes discussion, uh, discussing. Now, we only have a few minutes in this particular segment George Soros as I said before and and these people on the hill listen they listen but they don't act George Soros is a multi-billionaire who hates America who hates Israel who funds the radical left the Marxist causes the Islamist causes his son Alex is taking over because George is long in the tooth not long enough as far as I'm concerned but that's a whole other story And Alex has access to Biden, he has access to Harris, he has access to anybody he wants. Why? Because he's the sugar daddy of the radical Marxist slash Islamist movements in this country. Whatever works to take us down. How come there's no House Republican oversight of George Soros? They had a whole committee working on Donald Trump for years on his taxes. Issuing subpoenas and so forth. They set the precedent. How come there's nobody looking into all of these front groups that he set up, front groups that he supports, the networks and connections between and among these front groups and overseas groups and anti-American groups and violent groups and how he has bought through Media Matters a big chunk of the American media that uses Media Matters despite the fact that the head of Media Matters is homophobic, is a racist, is a bigot, and an anti-Semite. Like much of the Democrat Party in the media, as a matter of fact. And this is from our friends at Newsbusters. Joseph Aquez, leftist billionaire George Soros, 
Open Society Foundation finally released a statement condemning Hamas's hellish at- attacks on Israel nearly three and a half weeks after the October 7 massacre. But it did so while trying to make believe that the fortunate funneled into the groups championing Hamas barbarism didn't exist. The OSF fact sheet Open Society Foundations in Israel and Palestine, which supplemented the organization's November 1 press release on Hamas, attempted to equivocate the conflict involving the Jewish state and the terrorist organization as a territorial dispute between Israel and, quote, occupied Palestinian territories. Now, as soon as you hear that, you know these are a bunch of anti-Semites. How can Jews occupy what they occupied 4,000 years ago? They can't. They had the audacity to claim that, quote, all the groups we support are committed to nonviolence and adhere to the principle that human rights and safety should be enjoyed by Israelis and Palestinians alike. But the statement is demonstrably false. The MRC has shown that OSF has given to numerous pro-Hamas groups. The sorted list includes, but is not limited to, al Shabaka the Middle East Children's Alliance, the Palestinian Institute for Public Diplomacy and Dream Defenders, among others. Not only that, but Soros himself even called for the United States and Israel to embrace Hamas. Two questions arise. Why would this Soros group feel the need to release a statement three and a half weeks after the October 7 massacre? And why would it attempt to undercut its own record of funding pro-Hamas organizations? MRC Business Vice President Dan Schneider said in a statement that this has everything to do with uh, Soros's group positioning itself ahead of the 2024 presidential election. Schneider said Alex and George Soros are playing the same card that the left always does. They say one thing while doing something else. The money, their money, is still backing the radical pro-Hamas organizations that seek the destruction of Israel. But their words are communicating something different. They're creating a narrative specifically for left-wing activists to understand they've got to publicly back off of these radical pro hamas statements as we approach the 2024 presidential election just one year away. And it goes on. MRC Business released bombshell reports exposing Soros' history of funding pro hamas groups. So I have a question for Mr. Comer. Question for the Jordan Committee, a question for those who are overseeing corruption generally in law enforcement, in the law and order with the Department of Justice and the FBI. Shouldn't this be part of your job, too? George Soros funded Al Shabaka, put out a statement following Hamas's invasion, celebrating how breaching the boundaries of Israel borders expands the Palestinian imagery for possibilities of both resistance and collective freedom. They got $550,000 from Soros between 2017 and 2020 along, and the Middle East Children's Alliance got 700000 George Soros and all these surrogates need to be investigated. I'll be back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. I see... Here, the House Ways and Means Committee, chaired by uh, Congressman Smith, is going to hold a hearing titled From Ivory Towers to Dark Corners, Investigating the Nexus Between Anti-Semitism, Tax-Exempt Universities, and Terror Financing. That is a perfect opportunity. Perfect opportunity. To focus in on, among others, George Soros, Media Matters, 
These organizations, these front organizations that Soros and his son have set up, the relationship to American-hating and Israel-hating organizations, the relationship, these organizations, to Hamas and other such organizations, the relationship to the Democrat Party in the White House. And you watch, the Democrats on the committee are going to throw their bodies in front of this bus, but let them do it. And so, number one, I'm glad the committee's doing this, but number two, I want to strongly encourage Chairman Smith and the committee to focus some of their attention, if not more than some of their attention, on the Soros enterprises and operation, which seek to undermine our country, destroy our economic system, our political system, and undermine Israel and destroy Israel. And their propaganda operations with Media Matters and their other operations, these tax-exempt organizations. I believe Media Matters is a tax-exempt organization. All you have to do is go to their website. I encourage you to go to Media Matters' website. See what's there. See what they do. Why do they have a tax-exempt status? I think that's a very important question, don't you? But we will see. Now, I have something else here that I wanted to bring to your attention, as well as other information as well. Uh, Let's see. Oh, ABC News. Nikki Haley is running for president as a China hawk. But her record suggests a different picture. I've been warning you about Nikki Haley now for a while, as I have about Ramaswamy. But Nikki Haley is George W. Bush in a dress. Eight years in South Carolina, she's not running on a record because she doesn't have much of a record. DeSantis runs on his record. And Nikki Haley runs attacking Trump. She took a job from Trump as the UN's ambassador. She appreciated that. Mike Pompeo writes in his book, effectively and essentially... Uh, That she was a political climber, not a team player, and you can see that. She is the establishment's candidate. That's who they have now rallied around. She's the candidate of many of these rhino billionaires in the Republican Party. That's who they're rallying behind because they love the Bush dynasty. They never supported Reagan. But let me read the piece. Her February 2024 announcement kicking off her presidential campaign, Nikki Haley issued a forceful condemnation of China characterizing it as the strongest and most disciplined enemy ever faced by the United States. She said, China's dictators want to cover the world in communist tyranny. We are the only ones who can stop them. But years earlier, as South Carolina governor, Haley celebrated a deal that brought a business with ties to the Communist Chinese Party to her home state. It's a great day in South Carolina, she said. I'm so sorry I'm not there with you in person to celebrate what is a fantastic announcement by Juicy Group, Haley said in a 2016 video message obtained by ABC News that was played at a signing ceremony in province, China, to celebrate a deal bringing a manufacturing plant owned by China Juicy, a partially stain-owned fiberglass company, to South Carolina's Richland County. It also reminds me of when DeSantis was taking on Disney and she pops up and says, Hey, Disney, we would welcome you to South Carolina while he's fighting the culture war. We want to thank Chairman Zhang Ji and everyone at the Zhuxi Group for allowing South Carolina to be the first location of your first U.S. manufacturing hub, she said in the video. But since jumping into the race for the White House, Haley, who's seen a boost in polling heading into Wednesday night's third Republican primary debate, This made a tough-on-China stance a core tenet of her 2024 campaign. The former U.N. ambassador has aggressively criticized China in stump speeches, interviews, op-eds, and ads, carefully crafting an image that a Haley presidency would be tough on China at a time when concerns over China's influence have emerged as a major issue for Republicans in the 2024 race. Now you know why she's not running on her record. 
But while Haley has worked to portray herself as the China Hawk candidate for Republican voters, an ABC News review of her record as governor suggests a contrast to the image being presented on the trail. This was only a matter of time. Because she was not a great governor. Nobody's told me to say this. I'm not coordinating with anybody. I look at the records. And there's a dearth of information about all her great and profound accomplishments. Same with Christy. During her time as South Carolina governor between 2011 and through 2015, records show Haley embraced working with Chinese companies and recruited some to invest in her state, praising the moves as good for the United States and something that could help remind Americans what it's like to have, quote, a passion again, unquote, to, quote, work with urgency. White House hopeful Nikki Haley speaks during a presidential campaign stop in South Carolina state in South Carolina State House, of course, where she's promoting the opposite impression. In any event, she said, it reminds us of what this energy feels like, that we need to focus on that again, she said in 2012. In 2015, Haley ranked number one among Republican governors in Chinese investment. When adjusted for GDP, bringing in over $565 million in Chinese investment for the year, according to Rhodium Group's Chinese investment tracker. Haley's administration oversaw $1.43 billion in Chinese investment in South Carolina, according to Rhodium Group, a nonpartisan research firm. Why did it take this long for the media to dig this up? In a statement to ABC News, a representative for the Haley campaign, and she's been all over cable TV, by the way, she defend, he, uh, defended the governor's record, saying every governor running for president tried to recruit Chinese businesses to their state. Nikki Haley did it. Uh, Ten years ago, Ron DeSantis is aggressively recruiting Chinese companies now. And just last week, he scrubbed the Florida government website of proof of his recruitment. No, he hasn't. They keep lying about the oil industry and what, and what he's done in Florida and so forth. No, he hasn't. And so this is what you're going to get from Haley now. The question is, who will take on China as Xi Jinping ups the ante? And the clear answer is Nikki Haley. Oh, okay, and how is that a clear answer? By trying to project on other candidates what is your record? Nikki Haley cannot defend this, ladies and gentlemen. So she'll lash out on others. She's going to have one or two examples of, you know, somebody going to a Chinese restaurant or something. When confronted on the campaign trail about her work recruiting Chinese companies as governor, Haley has looked to downplay her involvement and has faced criticism for mischaracterizing her record, a.k.a. lying. At a campaign stop in Boone, Iowa in early October, Haley was asked by an audience member why as governor she, quote, gave China thousands of acres of land in South Carolina. And according to the Washington Post fact check, provided a misleading response. She said, don't believe what you read <coughs> on the Internet. We didn't sell any land to the Chinese. But yes, I recruited a fiberglass company. While Haley was technically correct in stating that no land was sold to the China Juicy Group, this is because the fiberglass deal did not involve a land sale. Instead, the company was granted nearly 200 acres of county-owned land at no cost. Now, isn't that sleazy? Contingent upon their investment in South Carolina. Now, this Chinese-run company with ties to the Chinese Communist Party include a top official, board chairman, Xi Jinping, who is a member of the company's dedicated Communist Party committee. In addition, state-owned company China National Building Material Company Limited owns nearly 27% of the China Zhuji and has several top officials who are also members of the Chinese Communist Party. She's going to be tough on China. Like a lefty, they always talk about what they're going to be, what they're going to do, but what did she do? The Zhuji group currently boasts, and by the way, can you imagine her running against Biden? That whole issue about China will be taken off the table. You took money from China, and you took money from China. What are you talking about? You went to the Chinese communists to get money into your state to get reelected. The Zhuji Group currently boasts total assets exceeding 30 billion yen, or whatever it's called, and employs over 10,000 staff members. And it goes on. And when this deal was sealed, Haley called it, quote, a huge win for the state. 
After leaving the Trump administration at the end of 2018, and in the lead-up to launching her 2024 campaign earlier this year, Nikki Haley has taken a sharp turn regarding China and its influence. In 2019, she delivered a speech on China where she expressed concern over the increasing Chinese threat. And in subsequent years, she's penned numerous op-eds warning about China's influence. 2020 Wall Street Journal op-ed. Written amid the escalating COVID-19 pandemic, Haley criticized the approach of U.S. leaders toward China, arguing that their methods of dealing with the United States were fundamentally flawed. She said from the 1970s through the Obama administration, U.S. leaders from both parties operated under the theory that as China grew stronger economically, it would become more free and less aggressive, as had happened in other countries, Haley wrote. However, in the case of China, she said, that theory was disastrously wrong. As it gathered economic strength, China moved, China moved in the opposite direction, becoming less free and more aggressive. As Republican candidates pushed to chip away at the large lead enjoyed by former President Trump, the debate between Haley and Ron DeSantis over who's tougher on China has escalated. Each has accused the other of being lenient towards China, citing their actions and policies during their tenures as governors. A pro-Haley group blasted DeSantis in a new attack ad claiming DeSantis even voted to fast-track Obama's Chinese trade deals, which appears to be false. Appears to be false. Even the liberal media said that's not true. Meanwhile, Super PAC backing DeSantis targeted Haley in October with the china Juxi deal, blasting the move as evidence of questionable judgment, dangerous on China. And DeSantis this week faced criticism after The Messenger reported that a Florida agency focused on the state's economic development scrubbed previous mentions of business opportunities in China from its website. Responding to this story, the DeSantis administration called the change a coincidence, the result of overhaul of the website. Let me get this straight. So the website talks about business opportunities in China, and you're the governor. I don't even know what's on the website of the people who work for me. I don't know what's on the website of Westwood One and Cumulus. I don't know what's on Fox's website. I don't know what's on my producer's website, my audio guys. I have no idea. That is quite different than advocating for and securing massive deals up to $1.43 billion with a communist Chinese front group. There is a difference, you know. And in 2015... Gathering of Chinese and Taiwanese manufacturers in South Carolina. Haley, speaking through a translator, expressed strong support for foreign investment in her state. Quote, we've been the number one state in the country for foreign direct investment in the last three years, she told the crowd. You have my personal cell number. There's nothing you will ever want or need. We won't work with you on directly. Now, clearly that's going to come up in the debate and clearly... She lied. Her staff lied before, and they will lie again. And remember when Tim Scott confronted her on taxes and the curtains? And she lied again. Now, it's bad enough that she's George Bush in a dress. It's bad enough when Governor DeSantis was taking on Disney. This is personal to me. I'm a resident of Florida, even though I live part-time in Virginia. We are. So this is personal to me. And for no other reason, when this governor's taken on Disney, you've got Chris Sununu who's opposed, Chris Christie who's opposed, because these are losers. These are losers. This guy DeSantis has completely, completely changed Florida. And he did it in four years. What exactly did Haley do? Nothing. What did Sununu do? Nothing. What did Chris Christie do? He closed a bridge. That's about all I can remember. More when I return. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. I have to tell you something that speaks to the very core of our values as Americans. About a veteran-owned company on a mission to make a real difference in the lives of our military members. And of course, I'm talking about our great sponsor, Pure Talk. I absolutely love what they're doing. Our veterans gave everything to protect our nation. And Pure Talk understands the sacrifices they've made. Now, they've set an ambitious goal to eliminate $10 million in military debt by Veterans Day. But they can't do it alone. They need your help. When you switch to Pure Talk's lightning-fast 5G network, they'll donate a portion of every new order to this 
noble cause. And you can make a real difference just by choosing superior cell phone service. And Pure Talk's plans start at just 20 bucks a month, offering unlimited talk, unlimited text, more data, and a mobile hotspot. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch. Let's rally together, show our unwavering support for our veterans, get the best service at the best price as well. Visit puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and switch to Pure Talk today in less than 10 minutes. It's the right move, and it's the American way. Is Mediate.com an anti-Semitic propaganda operation? It's a question I'm asking. Because it seems to attack every person, especially Jewish people, who call out the media, who call out individuals who seem to take the side of Hamas, like George Soros. I'll give you an example. Charlie Nash at Media. New York Post columnist accuses MSNBC's Ali Velshi and Mehdi Hassan of being Hamas run. I wonder why the New York Post columnist would do such a thing. New York Post columnist John Podhortz accused two Muslim MSNBC hosts of being Hamas run on Monday. Well, are they? Were they? Or are we just going to point fingers and yell at people? Just days after he received backlash over a disgusting and bigoted attack on a Pakistani-American journalist. Well, what did he do? What did he say? Look, on this program, we know who Ali Valshi is, and Mehdi Hassan, and they're Israel haters. It may well be worse. We do have an audio, after all. So why is media coming to their defense? And why are they character assassinating and smearing John Podhortz? Who's been the publisher of commentary, a well-known thinker, American, Jewish? Can't really say Ali Velshi and Mehdi Hassan are well-known thinkers. They're attack dogs. Podhortz, who in recent weeks lashed out, blah, 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 after Velshi reported that the Hamas-run Palestinian Ministry of Health says... 10,022 Palestinians have been killed and 1.5 million displaced from their homes since October 7. Pat Horace responded, the Hamas one, Ali Velshi, uses data from Hamas and tries to make himself clean by calling it Hamas run. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Why don't you tell us the numbers, John? Shot back Velshi. Or would you like to just continue to live in your fantasy world? where Palestinians get killed and no one counts or cares. Why does nobody count or care? That doesn't, that doesn't mean you take numbers from a genocidal terrorist regime and use their numbers, Velshi. And that's his point. You don't have the numbers. Nobody has the numbers. So the default position isn't to use a terrorist organization, now is it? Is it mediaite? You see, folks, we are watching MSNBC and CNN. We are watching the New York Times and the Washington Post. We are watching all of these Israel hating platforms, including now mediaite. I have to tell you something that speaks to the very core of our values as Americans, about a veteran-owned company on a mission to make a real difference in the lives of our military members. And of course, I'm talking about our great sponsor, Pure Talk. I absolutely love what they're doing. Our veterans gave everything to protect our nation, and Pure Talk understands the sacrifices they've made. Now, they've set an ambitious goal to eliminate $10 million in military debt by Veterans Day. But they can't do it alone. They need your help. When you switch to Pure Talk's lightning-fast 5G network, they'll donate a portion of every new order to this noble cause and you can make a real difference just by choosing superior cell phone service and pure talks plans start at just 20 bucks a month offering unlimited talk unlimited text more data and a mobile hotspot just go to puretalk.com slash levin l-e-v-i-n and make the switch let's rally together show our unwavering support for our veterans get the best service at the best price as well visit puretalk.com slash levin puretalk.com slash l-e-v-i-n and switch to pure talk today in less than 10 minutes it's the right move and it's the American way. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. 
Well, it's been a little while since we've had our friend Don Jr. I don't know why, honestly. Uh, he's busy. I get busy, but he's with us now. How are you, brother? I'm doing well, my friend. How are you? I'm doing fine. You know, to watch this courtroom stuff, and I don't want to get you in trouble in New York, is so disgusting. And then Ivanka has to go through it today. And Good Lord. But that's not what you're here for. First of all, where have you been? Tell everybody what you were just doing. Well, I, I just got off uh, a stage in front of about, I don't know, 15,000 people in Hialeah, uh, down by Miami in Florida, opening up for my father at a rally down here. Uh, just, you know, incredible outpouring of support. I mean, obviously down here you have so many you know, uh, people who escaped communism and socialism in Venezuela, Cuba, uh, and, and elsewhere, and they understand what's at stake. So uh, that, that makes it so much better when, you, when these guys are here and they just want to save our country. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. So it's always a great experience to be able to do that. And you, uh, you have a bone to pick correctly with Hudson bookstores in all these airports, as do I, as well as other places. Explain to the American people what's going on. Yeah, we've been, uh, you know, as you know, because uh, the right has been censored in everything. I started a publishing company with a friend of ours, uh, Sergio Gore, uh, to make sure that we could get voices uh, from the conservative side of things out there. And uh, the you know, Hudson News, the places you see at all the airports, they carry books and stuff. They refuse to carry any of our authors from, you know, Carrie Lake, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Charlie Kirk, other people that we published my father's books. Uh, you know, they won't do that, and they won't allow you to do it as, you know, one of the best-selling conservative authors uh, in the country. And so it is yet another example of just flagrant censorship. They're happy to take conservative dollars for gum and all of this, but they won't allow us to have a voice, and it's absolutely disgusting. But this is something that's going on in our country, and people just have to be made aware so they can think about where they're choosing to actually spend their dollars. 100%. So now when I'm at the airport, and unfortunately last month it's too often, I won't buy anything from Hudson bookstores, not a newspaper, not a hat, not a piece of gum, nothing. It is the only way to demonstrate that we're not going to contribute to our own demise, right? Oh, 100%. And, you know, we, I do that with so many of the things that we're working on, creating that parallel economy, because that's exactly what it is, Mark. We, we, we don't just have to vote in elections. We have to vote with our wallet. You know, we, we have to bypass these companies that are choosing to censor us. Uh, again, they're happy to take your money, and then they'll donate it to causes that you hate, uh, that can't stand you, causes and people that would fund putting you in the gulags uh, if they had a choice. And so, you know, again, it's why I started... You know, Winning Team Publishing, they can find our books directly on Winning Publishing. And it's why I got involved with Public Square, to make sure that we can align people of similar values and interests together so that we don't have to be giving it to the woke corporations, you know, like Target or any of these other places that are out there. Again, they'll happily take your money, but they'll use it to fund LBGTQIA++ trans indoctrination nonsense, and it never ends. And until we start voting with our wallets in force, they're going to keep doing it. If we do it right, we'll get them to bend the knee. We will win this, but we have to do it collectively, and we have to do it aggressively. Yeah, and, uh, you know, my book, when it came out, it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and typically at Barnes & Noble, you know, they have the, oh, yeah. the books lined up, based number one to number whatever on the New York Times list. They didn't put mine up. They'll put the book at the front of the store. There were no books at the front of the store. They'll have a front yeah. place where they put the books. There were no books at the front location. People literally had to go into Barnes and & Noble and say, where the hell is the book? And I see the sales number. We've sold far yeah. more books at Costco and Walmart than at books than in, uh, Barnes & Noble. So I'm telling the audience now, don't go to Barnes & Noble. Get your coffee somewhere else. Get your little dr dreidels or your little Christmas tree hanging things there. You know what they forget about it. Don't support them. How have they treated you guys? I'm sorry, what was that, Mark? How's Just Barnes & Noble treated you? And Barnes & Noble has been okay, but, you know, again, the, the problem is this, not even the corporate. I've actually had it where we, they, I have people, because I've had two bestsellers as well, so I see this. They'll go, and people in the store that work there, they're not doing it on behest of the store, but they're actually hiding conservative books. I had it where yeah. I was number one, and there was no number one. The, the best-selling books started at number two, and, oh, can I have this book? And you see it, like, it's hidden behind some obscure cookbook, and they're like, okay, it's here. But literally someone was there actively trying to hide it. You know, Hudson's been the biggest offender. They won't even accept our books at all. 
uh, you know, that, that's, that's pretty scary, especially when you're talking about books that are bestsellers, right? It's not like these are obscure books that we're at. These are books that by any other list would have it. The New York Times did that to me. I was New York Times number one bestseller on my first book. Second book I published myself. They wouldn't even look at it because we published it ourselves. But I said, here's my Shopify password. I'll give you all of the information. You can go look to make sure that these are legitimate sales. I was going to give that to someone at the New York Times. They wouldn't even do it because they were perfectly content not even talking about it. It would have been a number one bestseller. Didn't matter. It blew away number two, three, four, five, and six uh, Mm -hmm. that week. Didn't matter. They are going to do whatever they can to suppress our ability to get out there. They won't even acknowledge our existence. And this is not probably just in books anymore. You're seeing this happening across the spectrum, Mark. So we just have to become more vigilant. We have to fight back. Or, as you said, we're going to continue to fund our own demise. And one day we're going to wake up. It's going to be too late. 100% right. Well, Don Jr., anything else before we uh, depart here? Uh, well, I'm just looking forward to get, getting you when you're down in Florida next, Mark. We've got to get another dinner going. I'm here. <laughs> we got to work it out. We'll work it out with Sergio. He'll help us out. We'll make it happen, my friend. Thanks so much. Take care of yourself. God bless. You too. Be well. It's a great fighter. Great fighter. I want to circle back quickly to this media piece. And what you're going to see, and this is typical because I've experienced this, is they're piling on John Podhortz. It's like a mob, a mob of these radical pro-Hamas leftists. And that's what Mediaite is supporting here. So John Podhortz takes these people on. So he's attacked by Ali Velshi and Mehdi Hassan. Many of you don't even know who they are because they work at MSNBC. The issue isn't what John Podhortz said, which is obvious. The issue is why did MSNBC hire these people? You know, you can hire people of the Muslim faith who aren't radicalized uh, sympathizers for Hamas and Israel haters. I can name many of them who we deal with on this program all the time, but that's not who they hired. They hired these radicals. And then, of course, uh, they bring in a few hacks from other publications like the Daily Beast and the Huffington Post. That's the way it works. Typically, it'll be Media Matters and Mediaite then the Daily Beast and the Huffington Post and MSNBC, and they pile on. And they especially pile on Jews who object to what they're doing. Pod Hortz being one of them, of course. Uh, me being another, but we're not alone. So you have this guy at the Daily Beast named Wajahat Ali. He jumps in. Then you have a guy at the Huffington Post. And so this is how it works, just so you know. But we stand with John Podhortz and anybody else who wants to tell the truth about what's taking place in American media. And uh, this is not the 1930s and 40s. People like us are not going to be quiet about what's taking place. And when you have people saying what they believe publicly, then we will respond publicly. I don't care what their backgrounds are, whether they're Muslims, uh, whether they're Jewish, whatever the hell they are. What matters to me is what comes out of their mouth or what comes from their pen. And so uh, I will continue to respond to such things. All right, we're going to take a break, but I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. I have to tell you something that speaks to the very core of our values as Americans. About a veteran-owned company on a mission to make a real difference in the lives of our military members. And of course, I'm talking about our great sponsor, Pure Talk. I absolutely love what they're doing. Our veterans gave everything to protect our nation, and Pure Talk understands the sacrifices they've made. Now, they've set an ambitious goal to eliminate $10 million in military debt by Veterans Day. But they can't do it alone. They need your help. When you switch to Pure Talk's lightning-fast 5G network, they'll donate a portion of every new order to this noble cause and you can make a real difference just by choosing superior cell phone service and pure talks plans start at just 20 bucks a month offering unlimited talk unlimited text more data and a mobile hotspot just go to puretalk.com slash levin l-e-v-i-n and make the switch let's rally together show our unwavering support for our veterans get the best service at the best price as well visit puretalk.com slash levin puretalk.com slash l-e-v-i-n and switch to pure talk today in less than 10 minutes it's the right move and it's the American way. New York Post columnist. 
John Podhortz. You know, I've probably met him once or twice, but uh, I don't really know him. I know of him, and uh, I know what they're doing to him. And that's not something that I'm going to sit here and tolerate when they gang up on him. It's always the same crowd, the same uh, the same uh, uh, media outlets and phony media outlets. And we're not going to have time to do this in its entirety, this segment, but I want to begin with a real clear investigation, and they do a great job. Paul Sperry, in particular, is a fantastic investigative reporter. And he's written a piece today called Hamas Ally Care has been operating with impunity inside America for 30 years. Now, I've given you some background about this group. It's a group that's ignored by Media Matters, ignored by Mediaite, ignored by CNN, actually embraced by CNN, embraced by the rest of the media. It is a group that was founded by Hamas in Philadelphia. So what are we supposed to call networks that promote care? They're Hamas promoters. Hamas supporters. They know about care. They monitor this program. I keep telling them about care, but they don't care. C-A-R-E. And Sperry begins today's piece with, after Hamas massacred 1,400 men, women, and children in Israel, FBI Director Christopher Wray warned that the terror group and its allies could inspire attacks on Americans here on our own soil. He also told the Senate that the FBI is conducting multiple ongoing investigations into people affiliated with the U.S.-designated terrorist group. I don't know, are they investigating George Soros? I doubt it. What Ray didn't say is that the FBI has been investigating Hamas's biggest ally in America for the past 30 years without seeking any charges. Launched in 1994 as a secret front organization to support Hamas. According to declassified FBI wiretap transcripts and FBI testimony, the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, has in the decades since become, since become an accepted member of Washington's lobby community. The New York Times and other influential newspapers routinely describe CARE as, quote, a Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. Because the New York Times supports Hamas. Why else would they promote CARE? Although it has not repudiated its support for Hamas, which is committed to the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people, CARE was enlisted by the Biden administration in May to take part in a White House initiative to fight anti-Semitism. Remember, we talked about that just the other week. On October 7, and by the way, the people who brought that meeting together, they know what CARE is. The people at the White House know what CARE is. Sullivan knows what CARE is. Blinken knows what CARE is. Biden knows what CARE is. Harris, not so much. She's out of it. On October 7, the day Hamas terrorists butchered 1,400 Jews, CARE's National Executive Director, Niha, Nihad Awad, that's right, he's a wad, delivered an anti-Israel message in Arabic, which seemed to justify what Hamas did. And by the way, Nihad Awad is tight with Hamas and was at that meeting in 1994. Translated into English, it re- I wanted to make sure Mediaite, the Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, MSNBC, and Scarborough were aware of this. Because I know they're so interested in telling the truth. Translated into English, it read, All Arab peoples must go out on Sunday, October 8, and every day in demonstrations in support of the Palestinians and in rejection of normalization with the occupier and the apartheid regime Israel. So even Nihad's AWAD a.k.a. the Wad, even he claims Palestinians are Hamas. In support of the Palestinians, a.k.a. in support of Hamas. On Saturday afternoon, CARE helped rally more than 100,000 Muslims in Washington, D.C. Not a single reporter mentioned that. To instead condemn Israel for supposedly carrying out genocide in Gaza... In response to the October 7 attacks, multiple speakers called for the destruction of Israel. And by implication, the Jewish people there. With the from the river to the sea. Awad, a.k.a. Wad, was front and center delivering a fiery speech bashing Israel and Biden 
for not calling on Israel to stop bombing Hamas targets inside Gaza, which he called genocidal attacks. He threatened to hurt Biden at the ballot box in 2024 if he does not urge a ceasefire, which, of course, is stupid. The Muslim community is about 1% of the population, but in close races, that can have an effect. So Biden's wetting himself. No, he normally wets himself. I, 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 you know what, Mr. Producer? I would bet you a 1000 bucks he wears the pens, wouldn't you? It's okay, just a thought. We've discovered the language that President Biden understands. No ceasefire, no votes. So now they're blackmailing Biden. No votes in Michigan, no votes anywhere. If you do not call for a ceasefire, he then led the chant, free, free Palestine. You moron, you Islamicist. Gaza was free. It was turned over to the Palestinians, you idiot. Nobody was occupying it. You moron. There's many more things I have to say. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. So CARE, a Hamas-established organization within our own country. It would be like the Third Reich establishing a front group claiming to represent Germans in the United States, even though it was created in a meeting in the United States. The evidence against CARE is unequivocal. Who they are, what they do. It's right there in the wiretap transcript. And yet they have the run of the city in Washington. They have the run of the country. They have the run of the media. They have the run of the Democrat Party and the run of the Democrat Party White House. Why is that? Doesn't that mean people who give them such platforms and influence are pro-Hamas? Of course it does. Doesn't that mean media outlets, too? Of course it does. Doesn't that mean individual media figures? Of course it does. On Saturday afternoon, CARE helped rally more than 100,000 Muslims in Washington, writes Paul Sperry, at Real Clear Investigations to instead condemn Israel for supposedly carrying out genocide in Gaza. It was CARE, Students for Justice in Palestine, another Hamas group. It was Black Lives Matter, a Marxist organization. It was Answer International, a Marxist organization. All revolutionaries, all who seek to destroy the United States, as well as Israel, obviously. AWOD, who runs CARE, who established CARE, who was at that meeting, was front and center delivering his Israel bashing speech. Also, AWOD promised to provide legal support to Muslim Americans who protest in support of Palestine. We are with you, he said. The people of Gaza rely on your voices and activism. Protesters later marched on the White House where they defaced the white brick gate of the Executive Mansion, with red paint symbolizing the blood of Gazans who had died from Israeli army counterstrikes. Awad is on record declaring his support for Hamas. Well, he should, since that's him. At Barry University in 1994, for example, he said, I am in support of the Hamas movement. He sure is, because he's part of it. Care did not respond to requests for comment, but without it. And by the way, Awad. If that is your name, you're welcome to come on my program. Just ask. We'd love to have you. Care did not respond to requests for comment, but without addressing specifics. It is previously argued, quote, it's not a front group for Hamas. Yes, you are. The White House declined to comment while the FBI claimed charging care or its executive was outside their authority. 
Quote, the FBI is an investigative agency, and we don't make the decisions about filing charges or prosecuting a case. FBI spokes idiot Susan McGee said prosecutors make those decisions. The Justice Department did not respond to request for comment. Prosecutors make the decision. But the FBI is used here in the past. Well, CARE is now a mainstay of American politics, headquartered just three blocks from the U.S. Capitol, with 35 offices across the country. Its history reveals its close connections with terror groups such as Hamas, as detailed in the 2009 book This Reporter, Paul Sperry co-authored with counterterrorism expert P. David Gubatz. Muslim mafia inside the secret underworld that's conspiring to Islamicize America. I wonder if they'll run that on MSNBC. What do you think, Scarborough? Story began in the Palestinian refugee camp, Jordan, in the 1960s, where Awad, a co-founder of CARE, Omar Ahmad, where they were born. Both men eventually came to the United States for university studies. You see, this is where it starts in America's universities and colleges. By 1992, Awad was a key member of the so-called Palestinian Committee in America which helped finance Hamas. According to a 1992 letter from the Gaza Strip, Hamas asked the committee for money to buy, quote, weapons, weapons, our brothers, unquote. The letter continued, quote, the meaning of killing a Jew for the liberation of Palestine cannot be compared to any jihad on earth, unquote. Around the same time, the FBI was eavesdropping on several Hamas leaders in connection with terrorist activities which produced tapes documenting the incarnation of CARE in 1993, and we read from those for you as well, at a secret meeting in October. Omar Ahmad called to order the Hamas summit in Philadelphia at the courtyard by Marriott, never like those, in Philadelphia to discuss the formation of a new front organization to support their, quote, movement, unquote, in America. Awad was attending the meeting. According to court testimony by FBI agent Lara Burns, who runs a major counterterrorism program for the Bureau, Ahmad, Awad, and the other leaders were gathered there. They hatched a scheme to disguise overseas payments to Hamas terrorists and their families as charity. FBI wiretaps also recorded them stating the need to deceive Americans about the true aims of their planned American front group as Hamas launched a campaign of terror attacks on Israel known as the Intifada. And now you can see Media Matters, Mediaite, MSNBC, CNN are all part of promoting this propaganda. And they all know about what I'm reading to you. So they are knowingly advancing the Hamas terror group propaganda. They compared the deception to the head fake in basketball, where a shooter tricks an opponent guarding him into moving in a different direction. The group, according to the wiretap transcripts, Envision an alternative organization whose pro-Palestinian stripes were not very conspicuous. And that's a quote. Burns testified care was what they had in mind during the talks. They tried to mislead any authorities who might be listening in by referring to Hamas as Sama. Hamas spelled backwards. Oh, gee, how clever. They're not exactly the uh, brightest bulb in the chandelier, but they are vile and vicious. And they're Islamists. Ahmad, who co-found CARE in 1994, hiring Awad as executive director, and he's still there. That same year, both men have expressed hatred toward Israel and resentment toward their adopted country for helping fund and arm the Jewish nation. Burns testified during the 2008 terrorism trial of a charitable front for Hamas known as the Holy Land Foundation. It was the largest terror funding case in U.S. history. As part of the court filings, the Justice Department included care on a list of co-conspirators, underwriting Hamas terrorism. Hello! Though care and its founders were never indicted in the case, the Holy Land Foundation busted up as the main fundraising arm of Hamas in America, commingled funds, assets, and personnel with care, according to tax records and court documents. Former Assistant U.S. Attorney James Jacks, who was the lead prosecutor in the case, said Kerr has been identified by the government as a participant 
in an ongoing and ultimately unlawful conspiracy to support a designated terrorist organization, Hamas, a conspiracy from which care never withdrew, quote unquote. A federal judge agreed, saying, quote, this is Judge Jorge Salas, who wrote a ruling in July 2009. The government has produced ample evidence to establish the associations of care with Hamas. So why is care so prominent in the Democrat Party? Why is CARE so prominent in the Democrat Party media? Why is CARE repeatedly at the White House, under Obama especially? A number of FBI counterterrorism agents were frustrated that CARE's national office and executives were never charged in the conspiracy. Although the founder of CARE's Texas chapter was sentenced to prison, they said politics intervened. After 9-11, they said the FBI headquarters viewed care as a link to the Muslim community through which they might obtain tips about terror threats to the homeland. Brass even invited care officials up to the executive suites located on the seventh floor of the Hoover building to discuss outreach policy. That's the FBI building. We said, these are bad guys. This is Hamas. What are you doing? Former FBI special agent John Godoldo said, describing how he and other agents protested the special treatment afforded to care. After Kerr was named an unindicted co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation criminal scheme to funnel more than $12 million to Hamas terrorists, the FBI finally disengaged from the group. The agency stopped conducting formal outreach with Kerr's national office until it said it could resolve the issues with AWOD and other worrisome leaders. And it goes on. It's a very important article. It's up there today at Real Clear Investigations. And, of course... As Mr. Sperry writes earlier, and we've discussed, in May of this year, Kerr was invited to a conference, a meeting, against anti-Semitism by the Department of Homeland Security. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. This is Radio Free America on the Mark Levin Show. Call now, 877-381-3811. It's a pleasure to have my buddy Brian Kilmeade on the program. Brian Kilmeade, I'm convinced, has a uh, identical twin. <laughs> I'm convinced, Brian, uh, you're everywhere all the time. I don't know how you do it. People say that to me. You're, I said, well, compare me to Brian Kilmeade. I'm, uh, I'm a real slacker. Uh, but it's good to have you on the program, my friend. And by the way, your um, multiple appearances on the various platforms um, talking about this war against Israel has been absolutely superb. And I just wanted oh, to pass you. that on to you as well. Now, you we have a fantastic new book out. This is a killer book. I really love this book. Teddy oh, and Booker you. T. How Two American Icons Blazed a Path for Racial Equality. That would be Teddy Roosevelt. And Booker T. And I want to ask you a question. I didn't even know that they had known each other. Tell us about this. So what's interesting is they, they both wrote a lot. So I read up from slavery, which I think your whole audience has to read. And just to have a kid that's eight years old and remembers being called to the, the house on his plantation and a soldier reads... Uh, from a letter which he later would find out would be the Emancipation Proclamation, and his mom breaks into tears, and they, they hug him and his other brother and says, we're free. They go back to the house, and they go, well, what do we do? To bring us to that moment, and then to follow him as they go west to West Virginia, and at nine ten, all he wants to do is learn to read and write and learn the alphabet, but he's got to go to the salt mines, and that kid ends up being one of the most respected educators in the country, maybe our history, ends up being treated better uh, uh, like a rock star in Europe, and then combined with presidents, especially Teddy Roosevelt, to, uh, to make a real impact on the South. That was segregated. Mark, we don't duck it. There was segregation. Jim Crow was real. Poll taxes existed. KKK was there. Well, what do you think about a guy that was a slave and went back and put a school right in the middle of Alabama and said, about a thousand, fifteen hundred at a time, I'm going to educate people. They're going to learn. Uh, they're going to learn. They're going to do everything. Learn the classics, but they all have to learn to trade. They have to be so good. They have to be hired. But he needed people with impact. And Teddy Roosevelt wanted to fix the South. And when he was vice president, he read up from slavery. 
him and his wife, and they go, we got to meet this guy, Booker T. Washington. And in 1901, they go to New York City, and they set up a meeting. He says, listen, I want to come down to Tuskegee. I'd like to see this in person. Let's work together. And then McKinley gets shot. He dies a couple weeks later. He's president. We can find the letter. I'm saying, sorry, I can't come. I'm president now, but would you come visit me? And they had this famous dinner together, but instead, and the dinner was referred to by John McCain in his concession speech. He was at one point, it caused a scandal when a black man was invited to, a, uh, to eat with the president and his white family. And now there's a black man who's going to be hosting that that shows you the progress of America. And this guy loved the country. And Teddy Roosevelt loved the country. And even though he was rich, he was sick. He spent his whole life struggling to live between asthma and cholera. This guy could, had bad stomach issues, bad eyesight. Uh, he had asthma. And he didn't, he, that's why, in my humble opinion, that's why he lived every day and did uh, like there would be no tomorrow. And he needed a partner. And I just thought, let me, it, all over Booker T. Washington's own writings are Teddy Roosevelt. And I go, I got to get this. And then I went to, to Tweed, his great grandson, who knew Teddy's mom, Teddy's wife, because she survived decades after him. And he heard, she heard the, he heard the stories. And I go, what do you think? Do I have something here? He goes, you absolutely have wait, something. Wait, 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 wait. So you spoke, you spoke to the grandson? Uh, no, I spoke to the great, yeah, he's, he's on the back of the book. He wow. advised me through the whole book, Tweed Roosevelt, who knew Edith, who, married, who was married to Teddy. And mm-hmm. she, Sagamore Hill, for him, was a place with great-grandma's house. He went over there for holidays. Mm-hmm. That was before it was a state park. So he, like, he, he allowed me to transport back to that time. And I just think at a time when quarterbacks want to take a knee and national soccer teams are embarrassed by our country uh, and do it at a World Cup, I just think that people like Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington would be embarrassed about people that don't understand how far we've come and how much better we are than every other place on the planet. You know, even during the course of the Civil War and immediately after, there was Frederick Douglass. And he and Lincoln became friends, but they weren't this close where they'd have dinner together and so forth. But they did communicate a lot. And the funny thing is, you talk about Theodore Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington. You have Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And then after Roosevelt, you have, uh, of course, Taft. And after Taft, you have Woodrow Wilson. The worst. Who, who, who resegregates the military, who resegregates the bureaucracy, who rejects everything that came before him from these Republicans. And so you write this fantastic book about this relationship between these two men and how they were able to work together and how they, as you put it, blazed a path for racial equality and so forth. So how is it, do you think, that we've gone from a nation where minorities were mostly Republican because they, they fundamentally understood this, to where now they're mostly Democrat. Have you thought well, about um, that? Yeah, oh, I think about it all the time. Because in looking back at history, you know, Lincoln's a Republican. People don't even keep people forgetting that. First Republican. This guy, this guy sacrificed his life to, to free mm-hmm. the slaves. But he knew he couldn't do it right away. The country, even the North, wasn't ready. And, and I have a connection. I mean, Frederick Douglass spoke at Tuskegee, and, and Booker T. Washington looked up to him. And the link with Teddy Roosevelt and Lincoln, Lincoln's body comes down Broadway, and up in the second floor window was seven-year-old Teddy Roosevelt at his grandfather's house. He says, you have to witness this moment. And he remembers Lincoln's body coming down Broadway. So he knew America fresh, literally fresh off the Civil War. And he worshipped Lincoln from that day. He understood his sacrifice. And Teddy Roosevelt's mom was from the South. They, they, her brothers fought in the Confederacy. So if he wanted a perspective on America, all he had to do was go to dinner. And something flipped. I mean, the conventional wisdom is that everything flipped for because they, LBJ gets credit for civil rights reform. And, uh, and then Teddy and That's Harry Truman. That's where my Truman, book picks up. Yeah. That's where and, my and book Harry picks Truman up. gets credit for the Jewish vote because he was the one who recognized Israel. Yeah. I want to keep digging into your book. You have a very compelling way to write these books. In other words, Thanks. it's not mundane history. You bring history to life. And that's very, so very for. difficult to do. You really do. The book is Teddy and Booker T, How Two American Icons Blazed a Path for Racial Equality. You can go to Amazon.com right now, any major bookstore.
The book is Teddy and Booker T. How Two American Icons Blazed a Path for Racial Equality. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's linked on all my social sites. You can get it at any major bookstore. And we're talking to its author, Brian Kilmeade, who writes these great books. And you feel like you're actually there, the way he writes these books and describes events and so forth. Let me ask you something, Brian. Mm-hmm. These ideas you come up with and the way you approach it and the way you approach a book, are you just thinking of connecting one book to another book, one historical yeah. event to another historical event? How do you do this? So what I try to do, I, I never thought I could write a history book. I thought that was for the Dave McCullers of the world and the, you know, John Meach and those guys. And, I, you know, it takes him 10 years. But I just, I had this idea about George Washington as spy ring, and it was such a mystery. and It was in my backyard on Long Island. And I said, I, there's no way this is true. And I pursued it for 20 years, and I met people with family members. And I had just a yellow piece of paper, and I just thought this would be a great script if I can get someone to write a script. And I, I get quotes, and, and then I just, one day, I just said, you know what? Now they told me to, I, if you could just write this book. It's so much easier to make a movie. I just thought it would be based so much better than National Treasure. So I put it out there, George Washington's Secret Six. I, I approached it like a story because there's so much information that is still secret today that Washington put together this spy ring, and he said, without it, I don't win the revolution. And I, didn't, I couldn't believe how much undiscovered history there is out there. It did so well, it led me to the first war on terror. Jefferson fought it, the War of 1812, this orphan kid won it. Uh, the Battle of New Orleans, and then Sam Houston was mentored by Jackson. I go, let me continue there and find out about Texas. And it got me to the Civil War, and everyone's like, you don't want to write about race. George Floyd, you don't want to do that stuff. And I go, well, what if I had a link, you know, a link to talk about it? Two men made the country better. And then I just worked my way after that. I read up from slavery before reading Frederick Douglass's autobiography. And I just said, after that, I'm going to do this. And that just kind of just kind of moved up in that, in that way. I, I can't do... 15 years to, and I can't do a better look at John Adams or Harry Truman. These guys are just great. I mean, you, you read Hamilton, or Ulysses S. Grant, you think to yourself, I could do better? No way. But I just thought if I help get the country to rediscover their history again and get people talking and make sure it's accurate, build these stories around the quotes, so make sure people know my opinion is not in there. I just thought I could do it. And what I did is I took all the books and I go on stage. And I, I talk about it, like Thursday, and um, um, uh, I'll be in New Jersey, at BrianKillMe.com. I'm going to be talking about all my books and basically how America got great and all the stories behind there. And I'll let you know the unlikely path we took to existing, to surviving, and then become the number one country in the world. And I can't believe it. It's like being with the championship team, and they forgot they're holding the trophy. Mm-hmm. We're working around in this country, and they don't appreciate what they have because they didn't have to earn it. So I want, to te- I want people to know the, the people that allowed us to get here while never putting myself in that weight class. But uh, there's so many people around the Founding Fathers that did so much. I just wanted to see if I could highlight them. And this is a fantastic book, as I said, but you write these books. You, um, you are soaked in this history. Much of the research you do, I'm sure, doesn't even wind up in the book because it would be too big. And then you see what's happening today. What do you think Booker T. Washington, Theodore Roosevelt, some of these great, great men who built this country, what do you think they'd be thinking? Where's the grit? Uh, where, where's the perspective? Uh, where, why don't you understand where we're at? Booker T. Washington looked around. And he knew people with, for generations thought that people, he was lesser because of the color of his skin. But people were sobering up and understood it was just a matter of education. Benjamin Franklin the same way. The guy had slaves. He ends up an abolitionist. You grow in your life. So when people look around today, they, they want to call a lawyer. Uh, they want to complain about the cops. They want to sue somebody. They want to complain. They want to march. They want to protest. People that are successful and achieve take action. He was not an activist. He had to get stuff done. And if the Johnsons don't like him because of the color of his skin and the Joneses do, I'm going to go with the Joneses. And uh, the jo- I don't hate the Johnsons because hate takes too much energy. I'm going to keep going. And the thing that gave him additional perspective, Frederick Douglass, too, is when they traveled. 
And I thought that Booker T. Washington said something so cool. He went to the U.K., and and he's noticed in Britain blacks were treated better, but they were content with their place in society. He said, I want to be in a country where there is no limits. I want to be able to work my way up. I don't want a ceiling. And I thought, how amazing is that? Instead of saying, I could acquire, I could have a flat, and I could have this. He goes, no, no, I, the sky's the limit for me. Don't tell me I can't achieve. And they just kept going. It's like you, life is full of obstacles. We used to try to scale them. Now we want to complain about them. And we've got to get back to it. I don't want to sit there and complain about people that complain. I want to, I want to let people know that there's people out there overcoming things. And they compete. America gives you a chance to compete. That's what Roosevelt did. He competed. They thought he was nuts to go into the war. They thought he was crazy when he was governor. They said, we're going to hide him as vice president. And they did. And the president gets shot, and that crazy guy becomes president. Mm -hmm. He's not a crazy guy. He was enthusiastic about every minute of his life. He appreciated it. And he didn't care what people thought. Mark Twain, for some reason, didn't like Teddy. But he loved Booker T. He wasn't caught up in why Mark Twain didn't like him. He noted it. But he's like, I got to move on because I got things to do. And I got a country to make better. And I also think there's something else. If you are, and you do this on your shows, it's really not, it's the Mark Levin show, but it's really about the country and the research and your legal mind and the way you, the logical way you think and explain and communicate. You're making the country better, you're solving problems. You're not trying to get people elected for influence. You're trying to get people elected to make our country better. Booker T was trying to educate uh, a a country and a race of people that were far behind. He didn't complain about slavery. I'm watching Cori Bush today, yesterday, say, you, this chamber had me enslaved. No, you weren't enslaved. That was over 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now this country has given everybody an opportunity to put you in the house of the representatives. How people have forgotten how lucky they are to be here would probably be on the tip of Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington's tongue. That is so beautifully put, so profound. The book is Teddy and Booker T., How Two American Icons Blazed a Path for Racial Equality. You can go right now to Amazon.com and get it tomorrow. You can go to any major bookstore, any warehouse store. And go to my social sites if you want to link over there. And we're going to have Brian Kilmeade on my Saturday Life, Liberty, and Levin show right before his show. And I very much look forward to it, Brian. God bless you, my friend. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Mark, for all your support and having me on. I look forward to seeing you this weekend. I'm going to wear makeup, and I'm going to look really good in a suit, I promise. Yes, don't put on a wig and a dress. That's a different show. (laughs) That's a different show and a different network. Not on Fox. (laughs) All right, brother. God bless. Take care of yourself. Go go get him, Mark. Thanks. He's a great guy. He's a very, very nice man, and I enjoy talking to him. And I remember when he did his Washington book a few years back, he did a book signing at Mount Vernon. And uh, our home... It's not that far from Mount Vernon. It's not a straight shot, but it's not that far, and I love Mount Vernon. And he invited uh, Julie and me to go, and we went. We had a hell of a good time. He's just, uh, like I say, he's a very, very good guy, and he's as nice in person as he is pub- publicly. Good guy. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. I wanted to get to uh, something here about Photographers Without Borders by a great website. You might want to check it out. It's called HonestReporting.com. Now, what are they talking about? Well, I'll tell you. On October 7, Hamas terrorists were not the only ones who documented the war crimes they had committed during their deadly rampage across southern Israel. Some of their atrocities were captured by Gaza-based photojournalists working for the Associated Press and Reuters, whose early morning presence at the breached border, well, it raises serious ethical questions. What were they doing there so early on what would ordinarily have been a quiet Saturday morning? They're talking about the press. AP and Reuters. Was it coordinated with Hamas? 
Did the respectable wire services, which publish their photos, approve of their presence inside enemy territory, together with the terrorist infiltrators? Did the photojournalist who freelance for other media, like CNN, CNN's always there on the wrong side, and the New York Times, always there on the wrong side, did they notify these outlets? Judging from the pictures of lynching, kidnapping, and storming of an Israeli kibbutz, it seems like the border has been breached not only physically, but also journalistically. Four names appear on AP's photo credits from the Israel-Gaza border area on October 7. You ready, MSNBC? The Daily Beast, Huffington Post, Mediate, Hassan Eslaya, Yosef Mossad, Ali Mahmoud, and Hatim Ali. Eslaya, a freelancer who also works for CNN, crossed into Israel, took photos of a burning Israeli tank, then captured infiltrators entering the kibbutz Kafar Azar. That is, photos of it. Honest reporting has obtained screenshots, screenshots rather, of Ishlaya's now removed tweets on X, in which he documented himself standing in front of the Israeli tank. He didn't wear a press vest or a helmet, and the Arabic caption of his tweet read, live from inside Gaza Strip settlements. Shortly after the publication of this article, we were alerted to footage of Hassan Elisha next to the Israeli tank. In addition, a photo has surfaced showing him with Hamas leader and mastermind of October 7 massacre, Yahya Yabadabadu Sinwar. And here's footage, they have it all there, of Ishal after he crossed into Israel and took photos of a burning tank. He then captured infiltrators ending the kibbutz. Note that again, he's not identified as a member of the press. Massad, who also works for the New York Times, he was there as well just in time to set foot in Israeli territory and take more tank pictures. Ali Mahmoud and Hatem Ali were positioned to get photos of the horrific abductions of Israelis in Gaza. Mahmoud captured the pickup truck carrying the body of German-Israeli Shani Lauk, and Ali got several shots of abductees being kidnapped into the Strip. Interestingly, the names of the photographers, which appear on other sources, have been removed from some of the photos on AP's database. You know, the media is so corrupt. Perhaps someone at the agency realized it posed serious questions regarding their journalistic ethics. So the serious question is this. You went in with the killers, with the genocidal terrorists, with Hamas. You went in with them. You must have been given some kind of heads up. You didn't all just show up there coincidentally. Didn't you have an obligation working for CNN, working for the New York Times, the Associated Press and Reuters, to say something? What about that, Mediaite? You dumb little prebubescent morons. Reuters has published pictures from two photojournalists who also happen to be at the border just in time for Hamas's infiltration. Mohammed Fayek Abu Mustafa and Yasser Kudi. They both took pictures of a burning Israeli tank on the Israeli side of the border. But Abu Mustafa went further. He took pictures of a lynch mob brutalizing the body of an Israeli soldier who was dragged out of the tank. Reuters was kind enough to add a graphic warning to the photo caption, but it didn't prevent editors from shamelessly labeling it as one of the images of the day, quote unquote, on their editorial database. Let's be clear. News agencies may claim that these people were just doing their job, documenting war crimes, unfortunately, may be part of it, but it's not that simple. It's now obvious Hamas had planned its October 7 attack on Israel for a very long time. Its scale, its brutal aims, its massive documentation had been prepared for months, if not years. Everything was taken into account, the deployments, the timing, as well as the use of body cams and mobile phone videos for sharing the atrocities. Is it conceivable to assume that so-called journalists just happened to appear early in the morning at the border without prior coordination with the terrorists? Or were they part of the plan? Even if they didn't know the exact details of what was going to happen, once it unfolded, they did not realize they were breaching a border? And if so, did they notify the news agencies? 
some sort of communication was undoubtedly necessary before, after, or during the attack in order to get the photos published. Right, Reuters? Right, AP? Right, New York Times? Right, CNN? Either way, when international news agencies decide to pay for material that has been captured under such problematic circumstances, their standards may be questioned and their audience deserves to know about it. And if their people on the ground actively or passively collaborated with Hamas to get the shots, well, they should be called out to redefine the border between journalism and barbarism. Honestreporting.com. So what's the answer, CNN? New York Times? What's the answer, Reuters and AP? Nobody seems to give a damn. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, our truckers, freedom fighters all over the world. And we stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel, even if America media do not. See you tomorrow, and God bless you.